My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. ABC Wednesday, October 9th. Y'all can play all day. We want books. We want paper towels in the classroom. Bet you want raises, too. I'm well, still waiting on the paper towels. Abbott Elementary returns with the new season. We asked the district for more after-school programs. They gave us $50 for class pets instead. Critics cheer. Abbott Elementary continues to be one of the funniest and most beloved shows on TV. What y'all doing out there? Taking bribes. Proud of y'all. Abbott Elementary. Season premiere Wednesday, October 9th on ABC and stream on Hulu. back with yet another episode of the OC. We are so close to the end. We've passed the halfway mark. And mm-hmm. here we are. The tail end. Seven episodes after today. And then we're done this OC journey. It feels like just yesterday we started it. But also it feels like a decade ago we started it at the same time. That's just what the OC does to you. Um, time means nothing. This week we we're talking about My Two Dads. Uh, a reference obviously to ryan's battle between is sandy his dad or is frank his dad uh and who's your, <laughs> who's your daddy who's your daddy is if they did, weren't so strict to the my naming structure of the oc this would have been called who's your daddy the first thing i wrote down had to call it out i'm not one for fashion but this is a truly terrible engagement ring that seth has gifted summer <laughs> it is it is just ugly on on all accounts the Seth and Summer engagement story of this episode, I think, is so funny and charming because it like it feels like a 1930s screwball comedy, right? Like they both <laughs> yes. don't they both don't want to be engaged anymore, but neither but one of them chicken, wants to like, be. Yeah. yeah, neither one wants to be the one to call off the engagement. So yeah, they're just playing a bigger and bigger and bigger game of chicken that builds to by the end, like. Seth is flying out to ask Summer's dad's permission. Mm-hmm. Like that's like how far this game has become. So also, God damn, do they fly a lot this season? I feel like there's been like nine episodes in airports and we're only on epi- and we're on episode nine. Every episode, someone's in an airport this season. I know. I was like, y'all need to like, <laughs> can, can I, we get it? You know, we get yeah. it. You have money, but you know, you could also... You know, you could drive. That's why I like that's one of the reasons why I like last week. It's like we're not flying anywhere. We're just driving to Vegas. Yes, I do really like how quickly it's it's a it's a double effort. Right. A, I love that Julie immediately like told everybody who Frank was that he's in the area. Like, like, I love this. She's reformed. She is reformed. (laughs) She's loyal. She's whatever. And I don't know. We don't have time for her to like. No do like three episode arc of like not telling them yeah and i don't know if it's supposed to be that sandy figured this out before julie had told them or not but i love the world where sandy also deduced who frank was immediately like he just like walks up to him on a pier and he's like i know what you're doing here like i know you're lying about your identity and like (laughs) yeah it's like he like comes up to him and it's like hey loca like (laughs) yeah it's it's insane but we'll get into the frank stuff I very quickly want to go over the Caitlin and Chris Brown storyline that's in this episode. (laughs) So like the way that my face, like the way the things my face and body did when like I saw Chris Brown, I was like, oh, fuck, that's right. It's like it's that thing where I don't know, Matt, I don't know if you've ever had this, but (laughs) I'm going to assume you haven't. It's like that moment where you're like, oh my God, who is this guy? Why are they here? 
and then it dawns on you that not only do you know who they are, you've probably hooked up with them. I haven't had that exact situation, but I've definitely had the like, wait, I know this person. And then I remember that it's from like not great reasons that I know that person. And you're like, oh, Mm -hmm. no, the Chris Brown of it all, uh, having not really been paying any attention whatsoever to the OC at the time, I feel like this had to have been the big advertising of the episode. Like Chris Brown appears this week on an episode of the OC back when it was a selling point. Like back when that was like, oh man, forever's Chris Brown is going to be on the OC. Yeah. (laughs) But like, man, that, that just like, you can tell that they're, I feel like so much of this season feels like a show that knows that it's getting canceled soon. And they're just like trying to pull out any stops that might save the show. And they're like, Chris Brown's here. We got Kevin Sorbo. Anyone still like Kevin Sorbo? Yeah. Like, actually, man, season four is filled with a lot of canceled celebrity guests. <laughs> stars in it. <laughs> but, well, you know, you, you know, Harvey Dent was right. You live long enough to see yourself become the villain. <laughs> seriously. But I, I want to throw something out there as a not teacher, but Caitlin's rough, 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 rough report in English. Like, if she had started a report that way and then, like, turned it around and had an actual report, that's, like, a guaranteed A. That's, like, a charming open to the to the uh, book report. The fact that her plan was just to say rough, rough, rough for 10 minutes up, up there and not get in trouble is uh, makes me feel like Caitlin's dumber than I've given her credit for a few times. Yeah. But I do have to laugh at her basically telling Chris Brown to write the paper for her showing up to class and he's basically just written wolf instead of rough for her to read. I was like, all right, that's, that's pretty funny. And then she improvises and does a great job. Yeah. It was all in service of that gag, right? Like it's just yeah. all in service of Chris Brown being like, ha ha, gotcha, bitch. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> and you don't want to be on Chris Brown's bad side as we've learned. No. So no. the meat, the meat of this, this entire episode though, is the will Ryan meet Frank storyline mm-hmm. right will they sandy, or won't they <laughs> yeah will they won't they um sandy correctly and i i agreed with sandy before he even said anything i was like there's no fucking way frank has cancer like the second that they're like frank has cancer and he's dying i'm like bullshit like i just immediately was like don't trust this yeah and sandy was like if he even has cancer so sandy's perspective was until we can confirm the cancer is real we should not really bring Ryan in on this. Kirsten's perspective Correct. is, yes. Kirsten's perspective is, why would a man lie about this? <laughs> we should have Ryan meet him before time runs out. Um, And she basically just kind of tells Ryan that Frank is really sick. And then Ryan's like, all right, we should have him over for dinner. Like that's, that's the vibe. Frank shows up for dinner. He's fairly charming. Everyone's having a good time. Everyone likes Frank. That's when Sandy gets the phone call to find out that Frank is, in fact, not sick. (laughs) That Frank does not have cancer, has a clean bill of health. Um, I have a feeling that this is going to be our story for these last seven episodes. Is Ryan, you know, the son, son overcoming his father and fully, finally embracing that he is a Cohen and not a Nat Wood type redem- like type storyline is what I'm guessing here. Okay. Um, is that your prediction? That is my prediction. I, I think right. that this is definitely not the last that I've seen of Kevin Sorbo on this series. And since they don't have any real big bad that they've set up at all this season, it's been so lighthearted and easy breezy lemon squeezy. I think that this is like a nice way to give us one dramatic storyline that we're following and a comedic storyline to follow with Mm -hmm. the Seth and Summer stuff. Like, I think that that's what these last couple episodes are going to be. Maybe not all the way up to the final episode, but I feel like that's going to serve a decent chunk of these last seven episodes is following that story arc. And then, you know, a beautiful final episode or two to just like tie it all up in a bow there is a line that frank says that i had to like recontextualize because he like ryan is upset with him for lying about cancer and he says like man this isn't even the top 10 of bad things i've done 
And it's like, man, if lying about cancer isn't in the top 10 list of the worst things you've done. You're a piece of shit. Yeah, like that's like horrible. Like how horrible has your decisions been? And we know from the previous week, like tons of domestic abuse, tons of drunk driving, tons of bad decisions. But like, again, I would put this over drunk driving. <laughs> like, <laughs> Maybe not domestic abuse, but definitely over drunk driving as a terrible thing. So that means that there's like eight other things that he's done, nine other things that he's done worse than this. Yeah. But not as bad as drunk driving. I kind of <laughs> wanted him to like name them, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted mean, there to be was like... the time when I did this and then it's like. There was a time that I, you know, there was a time that I beat the shit out of you and beat the shit out of Trey. And exactly. You know, like, like, it's just like, yeah, just run down the laundry list. Um, there was a time yeah, I brought over that hooker and made her your mom. Like, you know, like just I, he's I kind of wanted him to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Just who would have thought that this was the one time Kevin Sorbo wasn't acting. Um, but here we are <laughs> with. With the episode, they they part and like Ryan has this moment where I think the implication is like, no, he does think that Frank has improved his life. He's just not ready to accept it. And it kind of has this like, it's not that I'll never, but it, right now I can't. Yeah, type. not that I'll never, not right now I can't. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good way to put it. I have a feeling <laughs> that, again, my prediction is that we're going to find out that Frank hasn't gotten as good as he seems to think he's gotten. Um, and that we're going to see the version of Frank that Ryan uh, holds memories of yeah. uh, show up. I'm pretty confident we're done seeing Ryan's mom. I think that her showing up to the high school graduation was kind of the the end of, of all of that. So I think that this is we have to close the door on his father next. And then that's Ryan can full of peace move forward into being a fully functioning person <laughs> yes full of peace can move on to glory <laughs> yes <laughs> hey it's kaylee cuoco for priceline ready to go to your happy place for a happy price well why didn't you say so just download the priceline app right now and save up to 60 percent on hotels so whether it's cousin kevin's kazoo concert in kansas city go kevin or becky's bachelorette bash in bermuda you never have to miss a trip ever again so download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Thank you. I couldn't have completed this project without a little extra coffee. And since I brushed with Colgate's Pro Series toothpaste with an expert level whitening for a vibrant glow... I could show up to set each day camera ready and smiling wide. Well, Kelly, looks like a little Colgate gave you a lot of confidence. Colgate Optic White. Find it at all major retailers. <laughs> Looking for a new seasonal anime? Want to know what new anime music is out there? Looking to add a new waifu or husbando to the list? Or are you just looking for a modern or classic anime to add to your play in the watch list? My name is Nick, and I run the Waifus and Weeboos podcast. And you can check me out on Geekscape.net. Now, we hinted at this last week. The music budget has to be drying up at this point because we got a single song in this episode. Yeah, yeah. We got The Long Winters, The Commander Thinks Out Loud, which is the last song in this episode. So I'm assuming that by default, this is just the song of the episode or California. Like, it's it's not much to work with there. Um, so let's talk about pop culture. Let's just jump into the pop culture. You were actually at Comic-Con with me when I bought this book. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, it was one of the only things I bought at Comic-Con. I finally looked through it. It's amazing. Z2 Comics put out a book called The Illustrated Owl, where they brought in different comic book artists and their assignment was only using the lyrics to a song and no other additional context, create a comic strip of that song. Um, and they could they could choose to use the lyrics as like descriptor bars. It could be thought bubbles. It could be something being spoken out loud. Mm -hmm. But like seeing how all of these different artists interpret, like took these song lyrics and interpreted them however they saw fit was such a fun little like 
afternoon read. The one that jumped out the most to me is probably to this day one of the more controversial Weird Al songs. Um, in 1992, Al did a song called Trigger Happy that is done to the style of the Beach Boys. Mm-hmm. That mm. is basically the concept of it is essentially that it's Al's like gun control anthem, but like oh. in a satirical guise. Like, sure. So it's like, you know him talking about how much he loves his AK 47s and like, he's going to just kill the first person that walks through the door and like talks about like having to take his dad to his, to the hospital. Cause he had an itchy trigger finger when his dad walked in the door and it just gets more and more absurd. But the person who animated it did such a fun job of like the chorus is just, I'm trigger happy, trigger happy every day, finding these different, things that are related to draw that are tied to it and the one that blew me away was that he drew shirtless childish gambino from the this is america video with the guns in his hand but like it was like he was finding all of the like things since 1992 that have come out with a similar message of like we need to fucking do something Mm -hmm. about the guns in this country uh so it's just a very like there's just some really really cool things that people did with it and really worked out some really cool ideas so i highly recommend it If you're a fan of Al, it's a must have. And if you're just a fan of like unique art, then I would say grab it again. If you don't care about either one of those things, just ignore everything I'm saying. It doesn't really matter that much. But uh, but yeah, that's my pop culture. That's my little push. How about you, Joe? What do you got to promote besides the freaky kiki horror ball, the the freaky (laughs) kiki horror ball that will be next week? (laughs) Jesus. Oh, my God. I hope to see you there, folks. And you know what? If you can't be there, we are encouraging people to buy uh, Freaky Kiki Kinkster tickets, which means that your purchase will go toward one, supporting the Lambda Archives of San Diego. But two, like if there's, you know, a friend in the area that, you know, may not have the money or, you know, like if you... Like we want the like 2024 version of like the two little boys from Paris is burning and, you know, to come. And so we want like to be able to give access to as many people as can. But sometimes, you know, people don't have the resources. Freaky Kiki Kingster tickets help get those people there. And it's like, hey, just show up if we have tickets for you. We'll check you off on the list. But so if you are if you can't like come but you still want to support there's a way for you to do that and basically we're encouraging people to gay it forward i i am saddened that i most likely will not be able to make it out there for the kiki free the freaky kiki but i do intend to do anything that i can from the east coast to make sure that the freaky kiki is a huge success that happens every year so that one year i can absolutely plan for my appearance correct to what, one year maybe we'll throw a mini ball at your convention <laughs> oh there yeah that's it when i have my own convention no. one day we'll have a mini freaky kiki but that is not my pop culture pick for okay. for this week so my understandably uh, understandably <laughs> right so um so in San Diego, so speaking of local San Diego things, right? Um, and this is related to the Freaky Kiki Horror Ball because uh, someone who we're co-producing the Freaky Kiki Horror Ball with, it was in this show that I recently watched at uh, the La Jolla Playhouse called Velour, a drag spectacular. It is uh, starring Sasha Velour of uh, season nine. I think it's season nine. Uh, season nine of Drag Race, the winner of season nine of Drag Race, who is a brilliant and wonderful human being, uh, taking her point of view of drag and putting it into a like 90 minute show that is both like an autobiography and also the history of drag kind of rolled into one. So like in between those moments where she's talking about her life story, she's also doing like these really elaborate drag performances. Like it basically like think about your favorite drag queen. And then what if they had a theater budget and a theater setting to do really cool stuff? So it's projections. It's like reveals and quick changes it is flying on wires. It is all of these things. And someone who's in the show, 
um, is a local queen, Amber St. James, and they are uh, co-producing the Freaky Kiki Horror Ball with us. Uh, by the Love time that. this comes out, it will have closed. It would already been closed for two weeks after a like an extended sold out run. But hopefully by saying this, I'm manifesting that it will go bigger. Broadway, maybe Chicago. We're hoping that it's going to get some wings because it is a beautiful, beautiful show. And kind of broke my brain a little bit, right? Because like I've been to drag shows. I know how to act at a drag show. And when you're at like a theater, like the formal setting of a theater, which is another one of my like places that is really sacred to me, it kind of broke my brain because I didn't know how to act because I wanted to be like, I know I'm a drag show, but at the same time, I'm like surrounded by a bunch of like, you know, older white folks (laughs) that maybe would look at me like I'm out of place. And so I, I like, I was feeling that way in the first like 20 minutes. And then by the time we ended the show, I like completely forgot that I was at a theater and I was fully immersed into the drag culture of it all. Love that. Absolutely love that. Well, Joe, seven more episodes ago. Damn. This journey's almost over. Now, we've already agreed it's seven episodes of the OC left to go, but eight episodes of the podcast left to go because yes. I think we need to do, we owe it to ourselves to we do a, a series post-mortem. wrap up. Yeah, it's a, say goodbye to all of this, what we're going to be doing next or what we're going to just continue to do ourselves after this podcast ends. But Joe, I am so excited to go on these last couple episode journeys with you. So stay tuned next week for more White People Problems. listening to the Geekscape Network.